Thank you, Dave. That's very, you're very generous in your in your introduction. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, and to all of you, thank you for coming today. Welcome. And our speaker, as you know, is James Baker. Our topic is the major features of my heritage DNA. James, as you may know, if you've been coming to our programs, has been giving presentations for many years now and always does a wonderful job. So I'm really glad he's with us today. Um, as David said, our present, this presentation is being recorded and thanks to our speaker's generosity, it's going to be posted on YouTube um, for the long, you know, not for a time period, not for a set time period, uh, so you don't have to worry about watching with, within 30 days or anything like that. It'll just be up. Um, it usually takes maybe about a week for it to be posted after the presentation, so just so you know about that. Our next presentation will take place on Saturday, May 22nd, whoops, <laughs> Saturday, May 22nd from 1 o'clock until 2.30 p.m. And it will also be pre presented on Zoom. Our speaker will be Melinda Kashuba, and her topic will be Locating Living Relatives for Genealogical Research. I'll be sending out more information about this presentation soon. And I send that out to people who are on a contacts list that I keep of email addresses and um, I, I just send out information to pe let people know what's coming up. So if you wanna be on that list, let me know and, and I can add you to my list. Um, also, this year's presentations have now been planned through the month of December. Um, and if you have any questions about those, just contact the library or you can contact me. All the presentations through the end of the year will be taking place on Zoom. And they're all Saturdays, about the fourth Saturday in the month. Um, so David explained the technical issues, um, and now I'm going to give you a brief background on James and on his many accomplishments. James Baker has been an active genealogist for the past 15 years. I think it's been more than that, but we'll say that. In 2011, he completed the Board for Certification of Genealogists requirements to become a board certified genealogist with a specialty in German genealogy research. He also specializes in Midwest US early American research and DNA. He was an officer of the Sacramento German Genealogy Society and has contributed numerous articles to its quarterly publication, Der Blumenbaum. He also has written articles for the National Genealogical Society magazine and the NGS quarterly. For the past 10 years, he has vol volunteered at the Sacramento Regional Family History Library. He has presented a total of 15 webinars for Legacy Family Tree, for the Southern California Genealogy Jamboree, and for the Board for Certification of Genealogists Communities, as well as many presentations for the Sacramento Public Library and for the Sacramento Family Regional, Regional Family Search Center. He presented his first genealogy class in 2012. And since then, he has given over 300 presentations to over 40 genealogy societies at local, regional, and national genealogy events. Mr. Baker earned a PhD in sociology and social, social psychology from the University of Utah. He is retired from an aerospace and business management career. In his work career, he consulted for many large companies including Boeing, General Electric, Lockheed Martin, and Raytheon. He has been an adjunct professor of sociology at UCLA and USC. His most fun job was being the piano man at Shakey's Pizza Parlor. And so now I'd like to welcome James. Thank you, Beth. Let's see, I've got to push the right buttons here. I think maybe I've got them. Slide show from the beginning. All right, there we are. I think we're on. Uh, welcome, everyone. I just sort of whisked through the, the list of, uh, of people who are attending today. I recognize a few names of good friends. It's always not like nice, nice to have people like that. And I welcome all the rest of you as well. Today we're going to talk about really the uh, the several key features of 
of my heritage. And so we'll talk about different options that you're provided there, certain features that are unique to my heritage. Uh, they have uh, a cluster tool that is kind of unique to them. They also do a super search and they do a couple of other things that we'll get into. Now, my heritage is kind of like the number two uh, DNA group. Um, certainly ancestry is, is still the biggest guy. And of course, De ancestry is not only a DNA company, it's, it's for a long time been a major genealogy provider. My heritage kind of came along a little bit later and has been growing and is both a genealogy provider and is now a major DNA company. Certainly there are other major companies that are in this same world. Family Search is really the one of the major genealogy providers, but does not do with the DNA. Likewise, Find My Past, although I understand Find My Past is going to uh, make a purchase of one of the smaller DNA companies. I think that's living DNA. Uh, the FTDNA is, is strictly a DNA company, and so is 23andMe. And then, of course, there are certain other smaller companies. This is the opening page when you go to MyHeritage. They invite you to, uh, to join in. They will have, uh, from time to time, they'll have a good sale, like for $59 or $49. But I have made my comment here that maybe it will be free for you. And that's going to be the case as long as you have bought any DNA kit, like from Ancestry or FTDNA or anyone else. Once you're in the DNA club, you can, as the arrow says, and I looked at that this very day. I mean, this is not old time information. This is current. You can upload your DNA data and you can do it for free. And there are certain instructions that go along with that. And of course, if it's free, that's the way to go. Now, I know many of you are already on my heritage, but in case others are not, and you're wondering, is it a good deal? It certainly is, especially if it's free. Now, just as a reminder for people who are, who are looking at different DNA companies, this is my own preferred DNA testing sequence. First of all, you pay for the big one, and that's the Ancestry DNA Family Finder test, the autosomal test. Then for free, you transfer your data to MyHeritage, to FTDNA, and also to GEDmatch. And then for the overdosers, you need to pay for some of those other companies. And 23andMe is just in their own club. And so if you want 23andMe, you pay for it. This download upload process, I know that some people, when you hear that word, if you're a little older like I am, and maybe you're not that, that savvy with operating these different, uh, the different functions on the keyboard, and you say, gee, what's downloading, what's uploading, you can get them mixed up, and it can get tricky. Second bullet there says, if you've got any kind of a problem, you might need a techie, and so you get a nice, you're a good young friend, and it'll just work as smooth as can be. Now, one thing to note is that each time you transfer, uh, this is a big chunk of data that you're transferring, it'll take 24 hours or more for the, for the new company, like in this case, MyHeritage, to do their own massaging of that data, get it into their system. Because each company has its own specific algorithms and creates its own scores, which might be slightly different from one of the other companies. 
All right, here we have come to, to the DNA page. This presumes you're now in the club. And so, uh, so they're welcoming me back. So the, the top blue arrow under that DNA bucket, that's the several different DNA things that we're going to talk about. And those are the different options. Now let's look down the page and you'll see that over there on the left, you see those two arrows and the top one, that's where they're taking me and reminding me that there I have my own website that I have loaded on here. And you will want to do that because my heritage is going to do certain things with your data. And you see that I have a big tree there of 30,000 people. And then down the way, you see there's my DNA matches. I'm over 9,000 now. And along the way, they've given me a few of their special discoveries. You might have more of those. Now, this time we're going to focus on the matches because that's the big one. That's the one that's going to, to call up my 9,000 matches. So you see, I put a star there and we're going to click on that one, which will allow us to enter that world of matches. So here we've done it. And this is the opening page. This is the first person that we have on the list. And so the upper left-hand arrow, uh, I, I took this, uh, this screenshot, oh, maybe a couple of years ago, because it says at that time, I have over 5,000 matches. It, it keeps growing. And so here's my first person, Darlene. It tells about her. And then uh, if you go down to the bottom blue, the two vertical short arrows, that gives the score for Darlene. And my heritage is good enough to give it to you both in percents as well as centimorgans. Now, traditionally, ancestry gives it in centimorgans. And so I, I'm kind of tuned into that. So I always like to to help understand the score by, by its number of centimorgans. The 23andMe people do it the left-handed way. They do it by the percent. Now, my heritage is good enough to tell you both kinds. Now, move over to the right, and you'll see there's, a, there's those filters that will tell you different things that you want to do and different choices. And I'm going to talk about those in just a moment. Coming back to Darlene, if we want to view her tree, see where that blue arrow is that says view her tree, or if we want to review more about her match, like to look at the many matches that we might have together. So all of that useful material. <clears throat> now, just a comment about their number of matches. They got into the DNA business really quite late, 2016. Uh, so they're like five years in. And so it, it maybe took me a couple of years to catch on that they were doing it. And so I, I transferred my data in April 2018, three years ago. They started me off with 3,700. And you can see now three years later, I've what that all I've almost tripled my number. And so certainly my heritage is making rapid strides to build up the size of their database. This is important because for DNA results to be really effective, you've got to have a sizable database. And I think you need about 10,000 matches to get serious about it because to get a good representation of your various family subgroups, you're going to need, uh, need more people who took the test you know, to, so that you get enough good representation there. Now, currently, I lose track of the numbers, but I think uh, Ancestry claims that they're up to 18 or 19 million people. And, 
and, and I think they're as many as all the others combined. So, uh, so what's that? Maybe about ten, maybe maybe fifteen percent of Americans have now taken the test. We'd like for more of them to do it because that'll help us with our understanding the results. Just to put that in perspective a little bit, I got into Ancestry in 2015. They started me with 4,000. And so then I dug in and began to find relatives. But initially, some of those groups, I could not find any matches. In time, as I got more and more numbers of matches, the, the, the Ancestry database grew. In fact, it grew to 50,000. And then last summer, they cut it back and said, we're going to, to eliminate those lower scores. So now I still have 26,000, but, but that's, uh, that's really a good number. It's about three times what I have on my heritage. So if you've got a, this smaller database, and I used to have a smaller database everywhere, like if you're looking for third cousins, this is my, my fan chart uh, on my dad's side. And so I go out to my dad, one, two, three, four generations, that concentric circle with the stars, those people four generations out, if you match people who also descend from those people, those people would be your third cousins. And so you've, you've got to begin to have a fair number in your database so that you can really get a lot of third cousins. And of course, even it's just as difficult or more difficult to go out and get fourth cousins. The first and second cousins pretty easy. Now, as I said, my heritage is making a big attempt to grow its database. They know that they, they know what we know, that the more they can get, the better it's going to be. Well, part of their major efforts are they're making it a freebie. You know, if you can join for free, certainly a lot of people should join. And so talk it up, get all of your friends to join and uh, it'll be a great thing. But even now, it, they have enough, enough matches, enough in their database that it is, it's, it's pretty good now. In time, it's going to get even better. Now, bullet number three, one reason to look here is there will be some of the matches that you run across who only tested on my heritage. I think that's, you know, maybe 80, 90% of them are on my heritage. That's the only place they are. And then if you find some others that you already had, now you can get more detailed data on them that you could not get on Ancestry. And of course, we'll talk about that. Now let's go back to Darlene and where we were with that first page. And so, we were looking at the shared DNA people. And so I want to make this point of how we sort. Now, one way is that you just, you sort, um, you can see the different ways to do it. Um, you can sort bottom, the bottom one, they're the most recent. And so if you, if you've neglected to go to your site for a month or so, you can check in there and say, you know, who has joined most recently? So these are the different options of how you want your data sorted. And so I think most typically we'll just pick that top one. I think it's the default version where they just list people, the top scores all the way to the bottom scores. And they go all the way down to a score of eight centimorgans, which is what Ancestry does as well. Now, if we want to, uh, to jump right in here and say, I'm interested in a certain branch of the family. And so I'm going to put in a name 
and they will then give us in return, they'll give you a list of all those, those people who either included that name in their database, their tree, or the name of the person. So one of my families there that, uh, that I had in the fan chart was Kaler. That's a great grandfather. Uh, let's see, it's a great grandmother, so it's a great, great grandfather. So I'm looking probably for third cousins here. And so the upper left-hand arrow that says they have found seven matches for me. And so that very first one, Cynthia, she gets a good score, 116. I will have to look at her and see, see just how she fits in because that's, that's a real good bona fide score. Likewise, the next person, Rhonda, gets a good score. And then you see there's Steuben Kaler and some more down there that if I scroll down, I'd pick off the others of that group of seven. So that's one way to just focus on a particular family group. Now, one thing that is kind of important is we want to go down to the bottom of that page. So look, here we were at the uh, top of the page and we were making certain selections, but now we're going to scroll all the way down to the lower right-hand corner. And that's where you decide how many entries of matches you want on each page. And also on the left-hand side, this is where you change pages. Like you can go, if we were on page one, it says, and you could go to page two, three, four. You could even jump all the way to page 571 or go to page whatever. In the right-hand column, right-hand arrow, lower right, let's go down and see about that one. Because here are your three choices. The default is 10. I think the default should be 50 because I, I think that just works better and easier to, uh, to look at more people in one time without changing pages. So, uh, so that's what I do. I, I come to this page, scroll down and immediately change to look at 50 of them on each page. So let's presume that I've done that. All right, now let's go back and take an in-depth look at my third highest scoring person. You recognize her name because she was one of the Kaler people that, was, that came up when I said, I want, uh, I want to find out about the Kalers. So I, uh, I put a star there by her score. And then on the right-hand side, it says we can look at her tree or, um, or we can review her matches. Let's look at her tree. Lower left, that, that's Cynthia herself with a private. And then you just look at how she has, has shown her ancestors that go back to Kaler, to, to Johann Jakob Kaler. And I recognize that name because he is also my great, great grandfather. So she would be, because that's four generations back, she is my third cousin. And look at that. Can DNA analysis really be this easy? You find a match, you look at their tree, and there they are, just where they're supposed to be. Now, working again with Cynthia, this time we click on review the DNA matches. That's the matches that she has and I have, they're the same ones. And so in a moment, we'll scroll down and look at more data, but under her, uh, what do I want to call it? It would be her picture, but her picture's not there. She appears in a family tree with 67 people. 
And so I've already looked at that tree, but now we're going to, to go for the 67 people. Uh, her score, 116. Uh, my note here is that if she's a third cousin, which apparently she is, the average for that would be somewhat lower than that on average. So together we seem to be getting more of that DNA from that same ancestor. Now here's more on Cynthia. The top arrow there says that these are, this is taken out of Cynthia's tree. These are her ancestral places. And notice here's Germany, and those are the Kalers, and that's my same people. The, the Kalers, much like my bakers, came to Illinois, and so I recognize that as part of the connectivity there of her tree and my tree. Now I click on shared matches, and it says on the left, you and Cynthia share 79. So they're going to give us information now on those 79 people. On the left-hand side, that will be my score with that particular person. And on the right side, that Cynthia's score. And then my heritage is kind of making some suggestions of about what relative, what kind of relative it is for each one of them, both on my side and on Cynthia's side. So start off with Timothy. I get a score of 52 with Timothy. So he's like maybe, maybe a third cousin uh, or a third cousin once removed or something. However, look at Cynthia, she scores 859 with him. That's about what the score you get, they've noted this, with a first cousin. So see how great this information is that they're giving you. See, if we're accustomed to ancestry, all they would tell us with shared matches is yes or no. You've got a shared match with the person or you don't. They don't tell you the score, but this time we are able to know the strength of that match. So like, let's go down to the next one, Rhonda, I get a 96, but Cynthia is much more closely related and we become aware of that. And likewise, as you go down, that's the kind of information you get. Now here, I've really put some stars in here and I have said, this is an important slide. Now, this is, this is because my heritage gives you the exact number of the Santa Morgan score. You not only learn who the shared matches are, but you get the corresponding Santa Morgan scores for each that is for you and the shared match. And the scores for you and your target person and her shared match scores. Now here is how my heritage does it. They combine the two scores and they list them in descending order. But let's go back and look at what they did. Now see, my, my first person there, Timothy, he's only 52 with me. Rhonda was higher and Darlene's higher than that. But you see what my heritage is doing. They're combining our two scores. And that's the way they list them in descending order. Kind of an interesting approach and a useful approach. So with this list, you get an immediate idea of who's sharing, who's sharing who in each subfamily area. Now, just to be sure, th this is even more wonderful than you can imagine. And I sometimes talk about how wonderful it is that ancestry DNA gives us this list of shared matches because then we can kind of cluster those. Like if, if, if the match and the match and I, if we have say 20 shared matches, and I recognize that, that there are a bunch of them 
are all descended from my Elifritz part of the family, that's really good to know. And yes, that is wonderful, and it is probably ancestry's most powerful tool. But with my heritage, it's even better because you get the specific scores. So now I have an example, and it's, my example is from ancestry because I was I was trying to do the same thing on ancestry. I found a new match. The match has no tree but has a lot of shared matches in the baker side of the house. In fact, enough that I knew this person's descended from my great grandfather because we've got all those shared matches. So I send her an email. She responds and said, I don't know, I am adopted. I'd like to know. So here is Nicholas. He's three generations out on my dad's side of the house. So the, I know that this woman is also descended from Nicholas. Here's Nicholas's story. He came from Germany to Illinois and he had a large family. They had large families. You know, back then they had large families. And so he's got maybe 4,000 descendants. I get back to him in three steps a lot of these people are younger than I am, takes them four or five. So on ancestry, I have found a lot of these people, enough of them that I, I have a good cluster. And most of them are second cousins, once removed, maybe twice removed. So I say, how can I help the adopted woman? She's scoring 95. Now that's the score that would make her like a second cousin once or twice removed. And in fact, she tells me that I think she was about 50 years old. So, so I figure it'll take her four or five steps to get back to Nicholas. She and I have 20 shared matches. We know that that she's a bona fide second cousin. I know she descends from Nicholas. Can we do better than that? Now, here's the story of his children. Nicholas had 12 of them. Two of them died young. The others had children of themselves. And I've had pretty good luck finding matches for all those different family branches so that in mo most of the cases, about two thirds of the time, I can place my Baker relatives into their particular group. Here's my list of the 12 children. My ancestor Joseph is on the right, but there's all these others. And so now if I can help the adopted woman and figure out which one of those 12, that's going to help her get a little closer to where she needs to be. Now, as an aside, I have made lists. This is my ancestry list of my top scoring people. And then I've kind of placed them into certain family groups. See the right hand column is kind of color coded. And you see that the ones uh, descending from Nicholas are marked in blue. So on the right hand side, you see one that is Nicholas Baker descending from Amelia. And you go down, there's two or three others. Uh, Amelia's a popular ancestor. And then there's one Nicholas that is a double descendant from both Louisa and Nick. And of course, it goes down below that. So, what I want to do to help the woman is look at those 20 matches that we have in common and see what kind of scores she's getting on them. Now, ancestry doesn't tell us, so we, we've got to do it the hard way. Third bullet, if I knew the, the Santa Morgan scores of those, it might help to focus and figure out which which one of those children where she goes. And of course, my heritage does provide that data. 
So I emailed the woman and I said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to give me a score for each of those 20 people. And she did. She uh, and those scores ranged, they kind of ran, ran the gamut from 314 higher scores. She had several that were over 100. She had several good solid scores. And now second bullet, one important to do item for me was to look at the scores of her top score people those 314, 237, and so on. I didn't have any Baker scores like that. My only, you know, my higher one was just barely above 100. She, she's scoring higher. Now, why is she scoring higher? Because I think she's connecting with some of those people one generation closer. So now I look really hard and See, I have figured out already which ones of, of those bakers, which one of those matches belong to which one of Nicholas's children. And here, second bullet, it turns out I had defined three of those five of her matches descending from Amelia. And the other two I had not defined anywhere. They could have also been Amelia. It was clear that the adopted woman belonged to Amelia's branch of the family. See, she not only connects with Nicholas like I do, in fact, she and I connect at that fourth generation level where we're third cousins, but she's connecting with some other people with where they both descend from Amelia. So she only has to go three generations back those people will be her second cousins. That's why they get higher scores. And I just said that she was matching those people at a generational level closer than old Nicholas Baker. It took her perhaps four or five steps to get back to Nicholas and have a common match with me, but in fewer steps, she had found matches with her special shared match people. So that was that's what my heritage will do for you. And just to wrap this example up, here's a kind of a list that I had made of my Amelia people and the Catherine people and so on. And and see when I saw that her high scores were those some of those Amelia people, it kind of made it kind of easy to figure it out. So here, that's the beauty of the MyHeritage numbers. The, my Her the fact that MyHeritage gives you each score for each individual that you match. I already would have had those scores. I would have not had to have ever look up all 20 of those scores. So, so this is really a great tool that MyHeritage has here. Now let's go back to my third cousin that had all those 70 shared matches. And this time we're going to look at the chromosome browser. So we do a couple clicks and we're in the chromosome browser business. And it says there, upper left, Cynthia and you share six different segments. And they, they show it here on the chart. And then you can click on any of those segments to get further data about the exact length of the segment. And then you'll kind of know, like here we've done that on chromosome 12. There's a segment that is 31 centimorgans. Anything above 20 is, is really real. And so there's just no question about it that that's a good place for her to match. Now we're going to look at some advanced options and we will download some of that data. So here we have Cynthia again. And here, if we want to look at it with the uh, Excel variety, we can see which chromosome she's matching on and exactly the number of centimorgans. 
Look at that on the right hand side. She has on one chromosome a score of 34, 23 on another, 31. She's just matching me in a big way all over the place. And yet she is, she's medium far out. She's a third cousin, but by golly, you know, she's for real. So now I want to, uh, to, to move a little, a little further, went the wrong way. So <clears throat> we're going to talk about my heritage's shared match results and about the business of building clusters. Now, before with Ancestry, we like to build clusters. We do it there kind of the hard way. We make our own cluster. Well, they might help us with their through lines, but by and large, we're going to do it ourselves. But this time it's even better because we can quickly check on the exact matching details and we can look at individual subfamily clusters. And the tool we use is that chromosome browser. So we're, we're in that DNA bucket of all of, there's about five different choices. And now we're going to go to the chromosome browser. So they will, they've got this offering where you can select up to seven different matches and see how they all kind of fit. And so I've, I've kind of pulled the browser up. I've selected, uh, I guess I didn't select anybody's name yet, but on the bottom of the page, they said, now you can choose among any of those people and that's page one. Of course, you can go to any page you want to go to. So this time I am, I've got my seven people here. And so uh, I, I'm one of them. And then here's Cynthia. You see what color she is across the top. And there's Rhonda that we've met before. And then there is uh, a girl named Julie and her daughter, Madeline. We ran across Timothy before. And now we're looking to see how all these different people match one another. Look at chromosome five. That is kind of, of a, a family, subfamily chromosome that's kind of important there. But you look at these, this chromosome routine and you get a quick idea of who's matching who. Look at that number 12 and you immediately see what's going on with these people. Well, I've played around some with the browsers because of course, my heritage is not the only guy who has the browser. FTDNA has it. Um, the, um, uh, the GEDmatch has it. But here I'm just giving an example of different chromosome numbers and different subfamily people that I have run across on one browser or another and so for number five, where I put the star, that's my Kaler group and that comes from my heritage. And so, uh, so my heritage is a major player in this browser business. Now, of course, you wanna keep track of your matches. The, the top ones, the biggest higher scores are probably the most useful, but uh, but the, the lower ones will help as well. And you need to probably devise your own system to keep score. But here's my own system. In fact, I showed you earlier what I did for the ancestry thing. And I do much the same thing here. So here for each, this, was, this is what my top 35 people. And so I list their names, their scores, and I've listed here in the next column because I thought it would be useful whether or not they have a tree and then also what chromosome they're kind of big on. The, the next column is about what I would expect their score to be if they're average. And then for those who were un, 
other sites, I've marked down where they were, see some of the ancestry people. The CL stands for cluster. We're going to talk about those in a moment. And then you see what, what their particular relationship to me is, and then which group they're placed in. Now that's going to become important when we come to the new tool, the cluster finder, and good old MyHeritage came up with that three years ago, two years ago. And so it is useful to have a cluster of people because now you know they fit and they fit in the same place. So bottom bullet there with with ancestry i've done that routine to build my own clusters but here's a case of where my heritage will do it for us you go down here to dna tools and they've got several of them and so one of them is auto clusters click on that and here they have arranged for me different clusters of people. And in the top one, the top left, go over to the top right and it tells you how many members are in each group. And in fact, that's how they arrange them according to who's got the most members. So there's 14 in that first one, 11 in the next one and so on. You've got to have at least three to qualify. And so the last few, uh, the last few just have three people. Uh, the bottom arrows, the left-hand arrow, they, uh, they did this for me. They do it for everybody who has a score of over 30. And so those are your top scoring people. And so just about all of them were in that group, 97 of them. And, and then they say that the minimum threshold is 30. Now, what do I have with that? <clears throat> they've worked their magic and they've, they've done this for all of the people scoring over 30. They've identified 18 different ones. Now I can take a hard look cluster by cluster. I'm going to look at one of these clusters. I'm picking one that is more manageable, that has eight, eight people, eight matches. It is cluster number four. And so second bullet, I recognize some of the names in that cluster. I've already identified some as Elifritz people. He's four generations out from me, but you see, I wouldn't not have had to do it because my heritage could have done it for me. Let's enlarge the data for this cluster. So here's the green cluster marked on the left. I've gone that far. And on the right, here's the names of the eight people in that cluster. So I know that all of those people are in the, they're matching kind of one another. And I know that enough of them are Elifritz people that certainly the others are too. Now here, over time, they, you know, every day of the world, they're going to change it. And so every once in a while, you probably want to update your cluster data. And so periodically, you kind of do a check and you see which matches go where. And the bad news, it's not all that bad, but because clusters, they're numbered according to how many matches they get. One that used to be number three might now be number four. And as you get more people, you get more clusters. So now they've added another couple clusters for me. So here is my December, this is my recent update. And uh, so I can, I can, this is kind of fun to play with and it's kind of useful because you know which group goes with which people. So that was the top of the slide. 
and then this is the bottom. So, and then they give you the summary data. There, I'm now up to 110 people that they are doing business with. They will also give you that same information in Excel for those of you who like it that way. Now, remember the browser said you can look at seven people at once. And so because they have found for me on that one cluster, they had eight people. So I'll take seven of the eight and I'll, I wanna see how they all match up. So here they all are with their own special color and look at cluster number 14 and you can see this is, you just can't make this stuff up. This is really good. You can tell absolutely that yes, those people are matching one another. They are Ella Fritz people. Now it gets even better because you can hover over any one of those. And here's one that I hovered over and he has a segment of 44 right there on that, in that uh, same cluster. And I really like that because he is a fifth cousin. You just would not normally expect, he's getting a lot more DNA than he should, but he's, a, he's solid as a rock, even though he's a fifth cousin. Now this cluster data is part of my world of keeping score and, and it, it's really good because once you have seven or eight of them, then when you see some of the lower scoring people that my heritage have not, did not put in the cluster, but if, if the several, these seven or eight people, if they're matching a big bunch of others with lower scores, you just know absolutely that those people also go in that same cluster. So here's the new look for keeping scores. On the left-hand side, where the arrow is, see, I have marked down my heritage clusters. And that was as of March. That's kind of when they first did that. And I don't want you to look at those small, that small font. I'm going to blow it up for you in a minute. And so then on the right-hand side, See, I've added a cluster column. And so I know that within my chart, I know who's in cluster five or, or 14 or whatever. So that cluster becomes really a, a very useful thing. So there's my blow up from the previous page. I'm marking down the names of the people in each cluster. And then I also, for my own information, I mark down which subfamily group they might belong to and also which chromosome they're gonna be big on. And I've tried to color code that a little bit, but you can see how useful that is. And oh, here's another picture of showing that, that cluster column. And so <clears throat> see most everybody gets in there. Um, I think that number nine, see where I've drawn the small arrow, I think he came later, which is why he, he didn't get included. Maybe he's now included, I'm not sure. But see, now I know which cluster they go to and which group <clears throat> they, they would pl be placed in. <clears throat> Now, because my heritage only gives you scores for the ones who scored over 30, you can use the clusters and the browser as an aid along with the shared matches to add the lower scoring people. And so bullet number three, I could easily find many other matches who are part of that number chromosome 14 group. New topic, <clears throat> my heritage will give you hints from time to time. They send you an email, they say, 
we have found another guy who got into the club and he has a score of whatever. And so <clears throat> they have also, you know, they are a regular genealogy site and they'll also tell you, <clears throat> they'll give you hints about finding people on what I'll call the regular side of their house <clears throat> versus their DNA side. But, uh, but they're very good about telling you <clears throat> that a new, I think they do this for just really higher scoring matches. So here, uh, <clears throat> let's see, I showed you my top scores, but here's going down the way. <clears throat> this is my top 108 scores. And you can see that the, the cluster thing works uh, as you get lower and lower. You, we get more empties there. Um, but of course, we can begin to fill those in with the information that we have. <clears throat> now, by comparison, see, Ancestry is fuller and more complete, <clears throat> but that's because I've got three times as many matches there. In time, um, I'm getting, uh, my heritage is growing so, so quickly that uh, it'll pretty soon be just as good. <clears throat> now, another example, see for these different subfamily branches, I'm kind of making my list of how many people are descendants from Nicholas Baker, how many from his brother, Michael Baker and the Kaler family and so on and see that total column near the right. See, I'm, I've got a lot of people in those different groups and ancestry is very good about all of those different groups. See, I'm finding anybody, I'm finding representatives for just about all of those groups. Now, here's the problem, it's a minor problem and it will eventually be solved with my heritage but see, there are four or five of those subfamily groups that I don't yet have enough people and, and, and the sample is not large enough. And so that is just a minor weakness right now, but, but it's getting better. <clears throat> now, of course, as with all the other sites, <clears throat> they give you their ethnicity estimate and they gave me a little different than what some of the other companies did. I'm on all five sites and I think I'm, it's like I'm five different people. So I'm not much of a believer in the ethnicity thing. These people have taken me into East Europe. I don't know why the others didn't. And they've made me a little bit Finnish and a little Ashkenazi, but uh, who knows? Now you think we have come to the end, but I'm looking at the clock and I'm gonna tell you another story. So, uh, so don't quite get geared up to close out because I wanted to see for sure what, uh, what the clock said. And because I have one more story to tell you that is useful, but we're gonna pretend that we've come to the end and so, first of all, number one, my heritage has both DNA and a research capability. I told you how to do it for free. You transfer the data. My heritage has a little smaller database than we want it to, but it's going to be, it might be good enough for you right now. And it's going to be more useful a year from now. They offer a number of options. Some are unique options. That last one that we talked about of those clusters, they're the only guys who do that. Be aware of how you can find people with the surname option. Remember, you are not stuck with looking at 10 on a page. You can go up and make that a 50. And then they will give you this, this ought to have some big stars here because they're going to give you a total score and a long segment score. 
you're going to look for the ones who posted their trees. It's user friendly. Um, look at those ancestral places to see if you've got a match. And then it, that detailed Santa Morgan data for the shared matches, that is one of the more outstanding features. And that's something Ancestry doesn't have it. Let's see, GEDmatch has it, but certainly you get good stuff there. And then of course their chromosome browser is really very good. The cluster finder is superb. And then figure out a way to track those key matches. So you're going to enjoy yourself. Now I have another option that they give you that I want to talk about just for, for five or seven minutes. I have an entire presentation that I give on this. So all I can do is introduce the topic, but I'm going to give you enough to maybe whet your appetite and let you work on it. So this is only going to take five or six more minutes. <clears throat> so this is our bonus item today, and it is the world of segment analysis. My heritage has a neat tool that allows us to take a detailed look at the DNA results with each segment of each chromosome. This tool helps to define what we call triangulated groups, which can be located on a specific chromosome segment. This is even better, and it supplements the chromosome browser. After you push two or three buttons and get the information that you want to get, this is fine. This is where you this is what it comes down to. This is a screenshot of about 30 different matches that are uh, in a related area of chromosome three. See where the blue arrow is, the uh, columns A, B, C. The C column is for chromosome. So this is chromosome number three. Now, because go over to the F column, that's the Santa Morgan score. Look at some of these people who score good big scores, 15, 20, 14, 34. And the, the, there's one here, Becky, he, she's number 63. Go across to the right. I know that she's a member and a descendant of Perry. And so is that guy who scored 34. And so the area that they have is going to continue on down and will encompass about the next 20 or 30 people. Now, I've made the, my comment here. I started by including known data about some higher scoring matches. The Perry people that I've identified up and down the line See, I've identified in the right-hand side about five different parries that I already knew about. But the fact is that everybody on that page is obviously a parry because they're all covering that same part of chromosome three that the other known parries are covering. And so instead of only knowing about those five people, now I know about all however many 40 of them. That's the great value of this new segment analysis tool. Now, here's how you get there. You go to our regular DNA spot, only this time the right-hand arrow, it's, it's on those, what do you call it, an ellipse, those three little dots. You click on that and you get some choices. Your choice is the middle one where it says export shared DNA segment info for all DNA matches. So that's what you do. And MyHeritage then gives you a, an automatic message. And they say, 
exporting shared segments with all DNA matches list. It'll be ready in a few minutes. We will email it to you. And so you get this message. And then indeed they send it to you and it doesn't take long. It takes about two or three minutes and they will send you the file. And then with that file, you click, you open it, you look at it and you see what you have. And like, like this is what you get. Uh, upper, the upper left-hand arrow, see that's Darlene. Remember Darlene that we did business with? That's going to tell you all about Darlene, where exactly where she scored on all those different chromosomes. She's in about a dozen different ones. And they do that for all, anybody and everybody. On the right-hand side, this is what you get. You get this Excel file but you need to push a couple of buttons. You rearrange the data. And I found that it's valuable to get rid of the small, the smallest segments, say the ones less than 10. And then, then you're ready to go to work. So you rearrange the data, you sort it out, and you add a few columns, and then you get something like this. Look at the C column, that's for the chromosome. And so we're in chromosome number nine. And so like um, I've drawn an arrow down to a couple of people on the left. Greg Tittle is there, I know him. I mean, I know who he is. And then down the way, Melissa, I know who she is. And so opposite Tittle, you can see where in, where in chromosome nine, where his DNA starts and how long it goes, and I, area uh, column F, he's a 44 pointer. So all of those people, about 20 or 30 of them that are down below him, they're all in that same area that he is. And so, then we come down later to Melissa, she scores 41. This whole number nine is going to be useful for us. So I've made my comment on the right. David's 44.6 segment is so large, it encompasses the next 25 matches. We can bet that all of these are solid Tracy family people we can verify that by looking to see that each has a shared match with David. And all of a sudden, with minimal effort, you have identified 25 more people to put in that cluster. And that's the kind of a thing that this tool does for you. And so I thought that you really should just be aware of that. So now, Having said that, uh, let me see. I think we're coming to the end pretty quick now. What have I said here? What's the payoff for segment analysis? I've given you a couple examples. When we have confidence that a specific match or maybe a group, maybe a cluster of matches are members of a particular family branch and where those people have long segments, we can easily identify the adjacent people as members of that same family branch. Now, just as we did with David, we can do this analysis for others. And so that segment analysis is, is a tool that can just really quickly add, I mean, you can, you know, in a matter of minutes, you can add, a hundred or more people to different ones of your uh, of your known groups. Now we have indeed come to the end, and so I will stop the share, and we'll talk. Okay, James, uh, we have some questions for you. 
Um, the first, the first one was about this uh, centimorgan unit of measurement. It sounds like that's a unit of measurement of shared DNA. Can you talk a little bit more about that and, and how it is different from just giving a percentage of shared DNA? Uh, I think with the segment analysis, that would, that's what the, would make the center Morgan thing clear in the sense that it's like you have a map of each chromosome and, and they get numbers as you go across. Uh, and so you get a certain chunk of it and it's represented by a certain, a certain distance, the numbers. And li like we just saw on those segment analysis examples, if somebody gets a score, say of 44, that means from his starting point, whatever that was, say he's at, at, at number one, two, four, six, and maybe he goes all the way down to one, two, eight, six, because he's, he's a 40 pointer. And so that's the way they measure those centimorgans. And the centimorgan is based on how much of a particular chromosome the, the person has. Now, with somebody like that Darlene, remember where she had 40, 40 on one chromosome, 30 on another, 20 on another, you add all of those up to get her total centimorgan score. Now, I hope that, that kind of helps. Is it a measure of the number of uh, codons that are, um, that are the, the length of the, of, the, of the bit of DNA? Is that what it is? I, I, and I'm also curious as to where that name uh, Morgan comes from. Uh, oh, somebody just called it a Santa Morgan, I guess. I don't, uh, I don't know why. Uh, I, w I was wondering if it was from a researcher's name or, or something like that. Okay. All right, we've got a couple more questions then. Um, let's see, uh, on one of your slides, you mentioned extending the clusters and using chromosome 14 to extend your research. What would this extension look like? Uh, do you have any examples? Yeah, what, what you would do is, let's say, um, let, let's say you have, th that was the group maybe where we had eight of them that they had identified. All eight of those people are in chromosome number 14. Now, if we do our segment analysis routine and we plot out, we get the list of everybody who has scores on number 14 and you see where those eight people fit but mixed in with those eight people who got the higher scores, there will undoubtedly be, say, with, with eight that we know of them, uh, chances are there are maybe 30 or 40 or 50 other people who have lower scores, 10, 12, 17, nine, scores like that. But they're they're within that same area. They're they're all getting DNA in that same segment of the same chromosome, and so in addition to those eight people that that my heritage has identified, we can very quickly add those other forty people who are matching on that same segment, and also incidentally, who have shared matches with those eight people. So that, that's how we can really begin to, to add to the clusters. Uh, we have, um, uh, we have uh, someone has posted uh, from Wikipedia, the, the etymology of the Centimorgan. It was named in honor of geneticist Thomas Hunt Morgan uh, by JBS Haldane. However, its parent unit, the Morgan, is rarely used today. I, I guess there would be a hundred centimorgans in a Morgan. So that's that's uh, something that was contributed by one of our uh, listeners. All right, that's good. 
Now we have another question. Um, can these, can any of these tools and techniques help to identify an unknown fifth GGF? I think that's great grandfather, right? So can any of them help to identify an unknown fifth GGF or great grandfather? And if so, how would I do it? No, you're on, you've got to clarify that. Your unknown what? Uh, a fifth great grandfather. It says GGF. I assume that's great. Oh, oh yeah, great grand, yeah, great grandfather. Uh, so, can these tools help to identify an unknown fifth great grandfather? Uh, they they can sometimes. Um, now now certainly when you begin getting a cluster of people, you know, like I have some who uh, uh, okay, I've, I've got a good one here. And that is, again, that I believe we called it cluster number four. And those were Elifritz people. Now, Elijah Elifritz is my fourth person back. So he's great, great grandfather. Time was before DNA, that's where that line stopped. I had no information about his birth, his parents, but because I found so many people who were part of the Elifritz cluster and some of those other people they're matching my people, my known people, uh, and they're matching one another. And then some of them also have their own uh, family trees that go back a little further. And then some of those people who match at that, uh, there was one that I had, I, his name was William Ilgenfritz. And I told you, I said, no, there was one good thing about him and that was that he's a fifth cousin. So we connect at the sixth generation out. And so indeed that's an example of where, where it worked to identify a fifth, uh, a fifth cousin. Now, having, having said that, I've got to give you the disclaimer and say, it doesn't always work that way. Sometimes, Sometimes you're just, you just can't find the guy you're looking for. No, but I, I will say that I have found several at the fifth cousin level, some even, even further out than that. But there are some fifth cousins that are missing. Okay, all right, great. Um, now we have another question. Will this segment analysis help this working around the issue of endogamy? So endogamy, E-N-D-O-G-A-M-Y. Will this segment analysis help with uh, working around the issue of endogamy? This is a mixed answer, and I don't like I don't I don't like endogamy. Uh, Happily, I've not really faced it much with my own group, but I know some people do. Now, here's, uh, here's what you get. And that is with that segment analysis, you will know who matched who on a particular segment. Now, if it turns out you've got a situation where some of those people are matching you on both your mother and father's side, then, then you're still in trouble. But, but in some cases, maybe you can sort it out because uh, you will certainly be able to see who did they match with and, and on, on what particular segment. And uh, so you've got a pretty good shot at it. Uh, you've got a better you shot than you used to have. Could you just, uh, James, could you just... Uh, Tell people what the endogamy, what that means. 
that means that you're one of those unfortunate people that maybe your mother and father are related. They're like first cousins or something. So let's say if they are first and see, back in the old days, certainly in a small town, this would happen. If, if there's an island and there's only a thousand people who live on the island, pretty soon everybody's related to everybody. Well, a small town is not necessarily an island because you can go to the next town, but you still get a certain amount of this business of where you, you have a few people who are related to you on uh, on both the mother's side and the father's side. And, uh, and so that gets very tricky. Now, I will say that ancestry makes certain allowances for that as they calculate the scores, because uh, if you get into a certain area, like you get back there in New England in the 1600s, uh, some of those were small towns and a lot of people were related to one another. And so, so they, they, they have certain cautionary things in their scores. But, uh, but endogamy is always a problem for people who have that. Okay, great. And here's another uh, another question for you. Um, you mentioned that you uh, do a more extensive webinar. Are you doing another webinar soon? Um, let, let me think. Uh, no, not necessarily. I'm, I'm sure I am one place or another, but uh, mm -hmm. there's none that come to mind and certainly not the segment analysis. Okay, uh, and here's another question. How does my heritage protect living minors who have taken the DNA test? Um, I, I've heard the talk on that. And the, the talk is that some people are really objecting to, uh, to some of the companies that seem to, to play a little more fast and loose than others. And, uh, but I, I've, he I've heard a certain criticisms directed against GEDmatch, although I think GEDmatch has, has made some changes so that they, they're more protective of their materials. And, uh, but as near as I have heard, uh, I don't think my heritage, I don't think they sell your stuff or, uh, or they they peddle it or anything like that. So I, I think you're you're reasonably protected. Now ancestry goes to extra to takes you know extra super extra steps. Uh, I was talking with an ancestry official uh, a year or so ago, and I said, "Come on, when are you going to get a browser?" And they said, "Like never, because we are afraid of liability." With the browser, you can learn too much about people, and some people might sue us. And, and I said, well, what about the other companies that have browsers? And this official said, they don't have the money that we have. And so we feel like, you know, we are at risk. People could sue us. And so, so they're, they're taking extra special steps. They won't even give you a browser, see? So I, I, I'm assuming that there would be no names of, of minors that are available and, and in fact, probably no names of anyone who doesn't explicitly um, offer their name for, uh, give permission for their name to be included in, in any results. Uh, with some of the sites, now GEDmatch is one of them where they had that problem where they found good people via you know, for the police, you know, they found criminals. Mm -hmm. and, and, but then some of the, some people, the, uh, the real protecting of uh, privacy people said, hey, you know, we, we still don't, uh, we still don't like it that way. So now GEDmatch has a thing where 
you have to, you got to fill in the box and say, I'm willing to have my data used by the police or not. And, and I think a lot of people dropped out of GEDmatch since then. Mm -hmm. To my knowledge, that's never been a problem with my heritage or ancestry. Okay, we have one more question here. Um, what is the most commonly used worldwide DNA genealogy testing company? Uh, without a doubt, Ancestry. And, and I think just because they've been in business so long and they do other things, namely they do a lot of things to do with your health, uh, 23andMe probably has the second largest database I, I've heard that Ancestry's database is like, oh, 19 million people or something like that. I think by comparison, um, uh, my heritage might just be four or five million. But, uh, you know, we're, there, there's, there's got to be a place on the internet where you can check that. All right, that's all of the questions we have in chat. Uh, do we want to go ahead and, and uh, let people unmute and, and ask a few questions directly? Do you, uh, do you have a few more minutes? I'll, we'll have five more minutes. All right. Um, if anyone is interested in uh, asking a question directly, I am going to allow you to unmute. Okay, you can unmute yourself now and ask a question if you'd like. Hello, Mr. Baker. Thank you for your presentation. I was wondering if you could share uh, as a PDF, maybe your chart, your your uh, Excel sheet that you did. So to see what information you thought was important, like the Cinemorgans and all that, because when you get the cluster sheet, it really just has the name and uh, which cluster they're in. Per se, could you share that or? Um, well, I, I guess I could uh, send me an email and ask me that, and I'll see what I can do. I, I, I won't promise. Or if you want to send it to us, um, we can um, we can make it available. If people um, send an email to contact at saclibrary.org, if you'd prefer to do it that way. Yeah, now, now let's see, I've, I've got to be sure which one you're asking for. Is, is it the one where I gave my summary of uh, my top matches? Uh, it's the one that you were talking about how the cluster, doing the cluster, uh, and you explained the cluster and how you did that on the Excel sheet. You got rid of some of the uh, you told us you got rid of some of the columns and you added your columns that you thought were important. Does that oh, help? Oh, no, no, that one you can get directly from MyHeritage. Right, you can get the cluster sheet, but it just has what cluster it's on, not so much all the other information you added to your spreadsheet. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah that's just, uh, I know which one you're talking about, that's right. Okay. okay, do you want me to call it a certain thing when I request it? Call yeah, yeah, call it a super whammy spreadsheet. Super whammy? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Do you want to send that to us and have us um, uh, send it on request or, or? Uh, uh, I'll I'll do that, Dave. Okay. All right. So it will be available from us. You will um, request it to contact at saclibrary.org. Ask for um, uh, uh, James Baker's super whammy spreadsheet. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, do we have time for another question? James? James, do we have time for one more question? Well, if not, I want to thank everybody for participating and your, your interest, and I hope we did some good for you.
Thank you, James. Thank you so much. And, and thank you everybody for attending and hope you can come next, next time. Yeah, th thank you very much. I'm going to go ahead and, and put a, a couple more things that ch into chat. I've, I, I've put them in before, but uh, some of the contact information into chat. Um, so I'm going to do that right now uh, before we uh, before uh, we terminate. So I'm just going to take a couple minutes to do that for anyone who needs it. Okay, there I posted where to uh, view the um, the presentation once it's uh, posted. Probably be um, within a week that it'll be posted, and also <laughs> the email address to contact us at contact at saclibrary.org. Uh, the the spreadsheet you're going to ask for. Um, for uh, James Baker's super whammy spreadsheet. There, that's, that's what you should ask for. And that's, uh, at, that's, um, Contact at stacklibrary.org. And uh, I'm going to post uh, one more time um, uh, the uh, today's handout that you can click on to download. Hey, there it is. You can click on to download. Okay, I'm going to give it another uh, another minute or two for people to uh, download that and take any information off that they want, and then I'm going to end the presentation. You're most welcome, everyone. And uh, thank you for joining us, um, uh, James. And, and, uh, and thank you for, um, uh, for um, organizing this for us, Beth. Um, I really appreciate all, appreciate all your help on this. Thank you, Dave. Thanks, James. Thanks, everybody. You're very welcome. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and terminate it. I hope everyone has um, has uh, downloaded the um, uh, that handout. Um, if not, or if you had trouble downloading it, yeah, just uh, you can ask for that also at uh, contact at saclibrary.org. Have a great day, everyone.